Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Deutschland. <laughs> and uh, as people are joining, we'll just give you a few minutes to get on board first, and we'll give a few latecomers some time. It's just uh, at the top of the hour right now, so we'll uh, we'll give them a couple of minutes before we begin formally, and you get my bad joke, which you're all used to now. So <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. But see, I can see Karen's already shaking her head. Oh no, Michael's going to tell a joke. <laughs> Please don't. I thought about selling it, say, telling it in German, and then I thought that's not going to fly. I'll leave that to Gerd and Alex. So again, welcome to everybody who's coming on board. We'll do a little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions, we did get one by email, which uh, the gentlemen have already heard. So we'll have those answered when, uh, when it's appropriate. But if you do have any questions, you can type them in the chat. If you're new to Zoom, you just have to move your cursor on the screen and uh, a task bar will come up usually on the bottom of your screen and you just have to click chat and then your chat bar will become apparent to you and you can type away. And then just so you're aware, everybody sees that if it says everyone. So be careful what you type. I've had, I've made that mistake. And as you'll see, Kim Tien here is operating the board for us today. Anais is taking a well-deserved vacation. And so Kim Tien's running it. She's drinking the, uh, the, the Pinot Rosé from Stepp and having a really good time. You can tell how happy she is. <laughs> and, and I actually have both of them. I've got the, the Flugo uh, Riesling from Mikkelsburg. How's that? Yeah, there. And I've also got the Stepp Gewürztraminer. And I know that um, Kim Tien is a Gewürztraminer fiend. So she's quite jealous of me right now. So and there's somebody, I'm going to admit this. Oh, you did that. Thank you, Kim Tien. So we're a couple minutes past. How's my patter, Kim Chen? Is it working well? Mm, yeah. What? My patter. Am I keeping people amused while we're waiting? <laughs> well, I am amused. So yes, I hope everybody's uh, doing well. Yeah. But you have to be amused by me. I pay you. <laughs> <laughs> well, not now. I'm doing overtime. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Just so you know, Kim Chen, for, for overtime, she gets paid in wine. So. <laughs> All right, well, we're, we're three minutes after, so I'll tell a joke and then we'll get started. Um, the joke is, it's actually said in German during Monty Python, so some of you will know this. It's known as the funniest joke in the world, and so the English army would say it in German so that they wouldn't know the answer, because they would die laughing if they did. And But the Germans would hear the joke and then they would die laughing. So, And it is, um, it is my dog has no nose. And the other guy says, well, then how does he smell? And the first guy says, awful. <laughs> so, that's it. Yeah, I did. Did I see anybody? Yes, there. Ron, thank you. Appreciate that. And so without further ado, shall we get started? Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us in, um, in Germany this evening. It's quite late in the evening for you guys, I know. And uh, this is an interesting trial for us to do one at 5 o'clock Eastern here in Canada on a weeknight. And we're seeing how people are liking that and we gauge how many people sign up. Thank you, Opinion members for joining us. I hope that you do enjoy these uh, connections with our winemakers. I think it's one of the joys of being an Opinion member and it certainly makes my job one of the nicest jobs in the world. So we're, we've got uh, Gerd Stepp with us who most of you will be familiar with his wines and he's been with us for several years and I'm glad to say that Alex Fluga is with us and he is back with us. Thank you for coming back, Alex. It's delightful. And I think we'll get started with Gerd. And Gerd, if you wanted to do a quick introduction of yourself and tell us where you are, I can see you're in a, a wine cellar and also then do some tasting with us. Cheers to all. Excellent, cheers. Yes. So hello everyone. At the payment, we're really happy to be here tonight and for you today. Uh, I'm talking from my little cellar here in Bad Dürkheim, um, in the Pfalz region. Um, I've got a few barrels here. I work 
um, with vineyards around the town, but also in, mainly in uh, in the Pfalz, which is one of the larger areas in Germany for grape growing, um, and it's just adjacent to the Elsass, which is south of us. So there's some similarities in terms of um, uh, soil compositions and where it's situated, but we were a little bit more north, so slightly different in that context. For me to come here was a long journey. I started here. This is a cellar that we've used many years ago. My parents actually, they, they were grape growers and, and farmers and apple, they had an apple orchard and we also had a nursery. So we, in winter, we were um, taking in all the cuttings and the rootstocks. And this was actually the cellar for the, the cuttings of the rootstocks to keep them. And then we were, would we um, sort of graft them in spring and then put them out in the field. And then in winter, we put again, the circle would start again. I, um, I somehow decided after growing up here and working with my parents uh, that I wanted to do a little bit more winemaking. And because my parents were growers of the local cooperative here and did not make themselves a lot of wine, just a little bit for the home consumption, I decided uh, it was time to, to expand a little bit, start traveling. And I ended up in New Zealand. That was my first journey. And from there, from New Zealand, I went through Africa. I worked uh, years in Zimbabwe in South Africa. Um, I went eventually then to, to Italy to work more or less seven years in Italy, in Tuscany and around Italy, um, also helping other people make some wine. It's a sort of like, at the time it was like flying winemaking, driving winemaking. And having done that, I decided to go to a little bit more uh, into another sphere. It's kind of more uh, technical buying and so on. So I ended up, I went to London and I worked quite a while in London um, as a buyer and winemaker for a retailer, but always connected, of course, to my home place and so on. And eventually, after a few years in London, um, only almost nine, ten years, I decided it was time to to come back to Germany, to come back to my roots. And then I started this project, bringing back all the experience from winemaking around the world and working with a lot of quite interesting and famous people uh, to kind of connect that experience a little bit with what I've grown up with here. So um, um, we've, I've got a few vineyards here, um, around here, but I also work a lot with growers and um, we kind of sort of pick a few interesting sites along the hard um, mountain range and, and the fields around here to put a few um, wines together. And so far it's been quite successful. So I've done this the last 10 years. It's growing a little bit every year, but you see it's a garage and we've got a few other tanks uh, outside and so on. So it's still a reasonably small size um, operation to maybe what I was even used to in the past, which was much bigger. Um, so I work that way. So uh, team-wise, I, I have a few people working alongside, but also a lot of friends, which I studied with and so on, that, that we work together in, in the winemaking. And um, I still keep traveling. I still, uh, I'm still a little bit based in London um, for some things. And I do a, a bit of consultancy, international consultancy, of which one brought me to Argentina many years ago, 2001, I think was my first time in Argentina. And I've been back there ever since every year. And a few years ago, I started a project there with a few friends as well. So hence, I've got the, the Malbec, the Craft 3 Malbec as well here, um, which I make in Argentina, but then I bring it here to Germany uh, to, to find, uh, to kind of uh, bottle it here. So I've got a com complete control from the vineyard um, through bulk shipping here to the winery here, and then I'm bottling it also, because bottling for me is quite an important process. And it's, it's kind of where everything comes together. And at the end, that, that's where the quality is ensured and that what you're getting is actually the best from the vineyard and full traceability of every step as well. Um, this year, so we have, uh, in this year's offer, we have, um, uh, I'll start straight away with the whites now, we have a couple of Rieslings that are in, uh, um, in, in one box, in one case. Uh, there's a Königswing at Riesling, and uh, it's sort of hand labeled at the moment. I just took the sample this uh, this afternoon from the tank. It's still cloudy; you probably can't see that, but it's still on, on its fine lease. I leave most of the wines on on their fine lease until now, and it's going to be bottled quite shortly. And the same for the Fuchs Mantel. So they they're both on the fine 
and so is also the Saumagen. Uh, it's still resting on its lease. So that helps a little bit to build a little bit more the, the body, give some richness to the wines, a bit more texture. I like it a lot. Uh, we get uh, sort of six months plus two on the other side. So we get about eight months of a nice long contact with the fine lease and to build that structure. Königswingert is uh, it's just around the corner from here. It's a, a vineyard um, that's sort of more um, on, the, on the bottom side of the, the, the Fuchs mantle and so on. And it's more alluvial soil, so um, a little bit more gravel. It's a little bit more sandy, a little bit more, uh, there's a little, some loam and it's quite um, deep rooting for uh, the Riesling um, vines. So you get a nice, nice soft, uh, uh, structured uh, Riesling uh, with lots of white uh, fruits, uh, peach, um, good balancing acidity, and it's kind of a little bit of a fresh apple as well. So it's really uh, good. I've, I've already put a little test, tasted before. And you can really feel still the, 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 the lees, it's kind of the texture part. Unfortunately, we're not bottling it with lees. Uh, it's it's going through one filtration at bottling just to strip the lease out and to make it stable so you get a clear and um, um, yeah brilliant um, product but sometimes some of the wines are not fully fully stable that way so maybe some of my wines can deposit a little bit something because they're very minimal handled Fuchs model um, the second wine in the, in the case. It's from the vineyard side above, which is also a bit more terraced. Um, there's some more sandstone in that uh, as well. So you get a little bit um, of kind of a more interest, uh, another interesting level of complexity, um, a little bit more lemon. It's more flinty. There's more passion fruit in this. Um, I would never say it's got a little bit more minerality in that sort of um, way as well. Mm. And again, nice, nice texture through the leaves. Contact. They both um, picked fully ripe uh, by hand, and uh, and so on. If there are any questions, you can ask me, Michael. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just be good. I hope. So the next would be then, so that's, that's sort of two single vineyards and I got the third single vineyard, that's the Kalstadter Saumagen. And uh, this is pretty uh, dominant by, uh, dominated by limestone. And we talk in, in the wine, uh, sort of uh, winemakers and grape growers talk a lot about stones and terroir and climate, but it's actually quite important. Um, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit geeky sometimes because we get carried away, but it's very, it's a lot of fun. So this is like a limestone here. Um, get a bit different pH, it's a different way that the vineyards grow, they're a little bit more stressed, often heavily stressed, whereas this is sort of sandstone, so it's not a very rich soil, usually it's a bit more mineral lighter in that sense, get a good um, good drainage often um, as well. So they, they kind of two different things and they do really different um, things to the wines in terms of the, the texture, their presence, and also the, the, the flavors they develop. And usually with um, limestone, you get sort of a little bit more peachy kind of more yellow fruits, a little bit more Burgundian-like texture or quality, especially when you leave it a long time to leave. So you get a really rich, and these wines, all of them can really, really age like for 10, 20, 10 years, 20 years, depending, you know, they kind of go in that development a little bit, um, that develops at different speeds and so on. But at the end, um, they all have great potential. All Rieslings have great potential to age. If, if they're well made, Gerd, that's if that's, they're well made, yes, if they're well made, if you if you care, take a lot of care about mm -hmm. them, but also, um, uh, it, it's a part of the you know the yield and the, the all, all together, it's, it's kind of a composition of everything that uh, that plays into that part. But I like Riesling, so it's really great uh, food wine. Uh, the, the acidity is always great in, in Rieslings, you uh, seldom find an, a heavy 
Lee oak Riesling, they're light Lee oak Rieslings, perhaps. And, and I like to maybe use even some, no, not the barrique here, not from the cellar here, the barrique, but maybe bigger oak can be quite uh, advantageous if you, but not new oak. The, the flavor, what you're getting usually in Riesling is the grape flavor, the, the flavor from the grapes and from the work you're doing with, with it. And it's great with food if you need acidity along the food. So it's great summer wine, it's great with fish, it's great, you know, the whole year round um, with all sorts of uh, different dishes. And uh, great to mix with, uh, um, you know, exotic kind of advantageous modern cuisine type of uh, things as well. Uh, very good. So the next I have is um, the, um, the Pinot Noir Rosé. So um, that's made in a, in a method, um, it's kind of a bleeding method. So we'll uh, saigne, and so we just, um, when we pick the Pinot Noir, which is the next thing we're gonna taste, we'll, um, we'll bleed off 10% uh, when it gets into the tank. And that way we, are, uh, we have a very light color, very pale, which is uh, kind of just a little bit of color that comes off the free running juice when the tanks are filled. It's 100% Pinot Noir, so we, um, and um, oh, that's got good. So that's, that has a beautiful um, kind of raspberry, forestberry uh, flavors, really fresh, really creamy as well. It's pretty dry. There's a couple of grams of residual sugar to balance off a bit the sweetness. And um, it's got a good sort of textural part as well. Nice watermelon as well on it. Great summer wine, but uh, rosé more and more. People drink the whole year round. It's it's fantastic um, on its own, but also to um, to some salads, to some interesting food. Mm -hmm. I bottle all the wines under screw cap for freshness. Bring me to the Le Rouge. And here we got the, uh, the Pinot Noir, the 2019. And uh, that spends um, nearly uh, a year in, uh, in barrel. And in these barrels actually just behind me, actually some of those, but also the one in the next door room. Um, these are all uh, French oak barrels, 228 liters. Uh, plus minus a year it spends in there and um, there's very few of them are new. I usually get uh, second hand and uh, so second fill barrels um, to use for this wine. So to get to not over um, oak the wine to keep its sort of red berries and sort of this crunchy black cherry type qualities. And um, Nice richness. Pinot Noir is not a super uh, dense, super rich um, variety like some others, like the next maybe, but you get a good freshness, a good length. I will, there was a question before about sort of um, what, what do you think about 2019 compared to 2018? I think um, they're both great vintages, both of them. We, we get really, really warm summers these days here, um, early, early harvests. So we, we get full ripe grapes. Uh, this is sort of picked at 13 plus percent alcohol. Um, so um, we, we haven't uh, had a, a big difference between the two winters. I fear there's gonna be a big difference between 2019 and 2021 because we are a little bit colder this year in the spring. Uh, we had quite torrential rains recently. So we we'll, I mean, expect the 2021 Pinots or all of the wines to be picked much later and probably we'll see higher acidity and maybe a slightly lighter style, but 18 and 19 were really super rich, super ripe, um, high quality Pinots. Um, 2021 will have to work a bit harder. I think we're gonna go out on the vineyard soon to uh, take some grapes off and um, to manage a bit more the, uh, the canopy to get that ripeness and so on. It's not always easy to make um, a top end Pinot here, but in 1980, we were quite lucky with the weather. And 22 is to speak flat. And the, la the last of the reds, or these wines, 
is the Malbec from Argentina, which is a bit of a, a thing. As I said, I worked seven years in Italy, and when I when I got out to Argentina, I thought, my God, this is so lovely here. It's almost like Italy and Spain together, in 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 a setting that's unbelievable on the Andes Mountains. Um, beautiful vineyards, great people there, um, lots of lots of opportunity to to make fantastic great wine. It's ample old vineyards. I work with some 100 year old Malbec vineyard here. Um, it's absolutely amazing place. And you get some really ripe, crunchy, big, fruity, spicy tobacco. Because it's high altitude, it's not overripe. It's not um, it's not a sort of um, jammy or something. It's always re remains and uh, that sort of freshness of Malbec. And because, you know, when you're out there, a lot of the winemakers now, that's what they're looking for. They don't want too heavy, too heavy, heavy uh, Malbecs. They want something to go with food, something that people can enjoy and drink a couple of glasses and not get sort of beaten down by one glass of alcohol, super alcohol, super ripe um, Malbec. So this is um, the Malbec. And finally, and least, but not least, I have the um, ice wine, Silvana ice wine, 2018. We don't um, make ice wine that regularly anymore here. Um, 18, well, we were lucky um, to have frost, but only uh, that sort of temperature minus, we need about minus seven, minus eight here to get the grapes frozen up. And uh, it didn't happen the whole uh, season of 2018, but in January 2019, which is then still counting as 2018, we, we managed, I think it was about the 20, 21st or something. Finally, we got cold enough a night to, to pick the grapes. And uh, otherwise, I don't know, we probably wouldn't have picked the ice plant that year. So we, we, we didn't make it every year. Um, none in 2019. I made a little bit of 2020. Um, perhaps this year with the later harvest. So here um, we have something that's really, really uh, sort of grapey, apricotty, nice sort of peach melba flavors. I, I use uh, actually the barrels over here on that side um, a little bit, sort of a, a quarter of this was um, sort of just resting a little bit in barrel to soften it a little bit and give it a bit more sort of spicy, complex notes, a bit of brioche. Very good, nice balanced acidity, not too sharp, good lingering sweetness. And again, not over sweet, not overtly sweet. It's really a great wine also to do, um, to just have it on its own, or maybe some blue cheese or something which would uh, go along very well um, with this as well. So I think I'm almost through with the wines. Any questions? Sorry, I keep muting myself because we've got a major thunderstorm here. It's just okay, crazy. Yeah, you too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so I'm not seeing any other questions than the one that Alain had uh, had asked about the, the okay. difference in the pinots. And and if you can, Gerd, oh, Kim Tian, you've got one? You go right ahead. You go ahead. Yes, I have one. It's actually from Marc-André Castonguay. He asked, uh, love the 2019 Riesling Vom Koenig, sorry, my. Yeah, Koenigsinger, no, perfect. The Koenigsinger, he had the first, yes. So he said uh, he loves both wines and he said, how would you compare the 2020 vintage with the 2019? The 2019, as I said, they're both good vintages. I think in 2020, we had a little bit more acidity. So these are a little fresher and um, a little, just a smidgen higher in, in acidity. Um, which is great news for Riesling. We don't want them to be too low in acidity and, and too warm vintage. So the, the 20, I think it's fresher. It's a bit more um, steely, uh, that respect. Mm -hmm. But of course, the way I work them, they both uh, work, work out well then afterwards with the lease and all that. That's great. Thanks, Gerd. And uh, if, if you don't mind sticking around, then often we get no, no, questions um, for both of you at the end. And so I'll now introduce Alex Flüger. How am I with the, your pronunciation there? Is that, that about right with the umlaut, Flüger? Yeah, Greg's, Greg always asks me how to, how to say it. So yeah. so you go ahead, Alex, and introduce yourself and uh, taste us through your wines. 
yeah well thank you um good evening or good day everybody uh yeah it's uh it's night here in, in germany and uh but uh, i'm very happy to be here with you and uh, to let you know a bit more about about us uh, the winery and uh, the wines um so my name is alex pruger i'm the third generation uh, on pruger estate um but our family has been in the wine industry for more than 200 years and uh, actually the last name Pflüger means uh, the plower, the plowman, so working with the horse in the field. So uh, it's never been a bank family, we've never been in the financial industry, we always worked uh, in vineyards or in the field agriculture. Um, we started as a, as a mixed farm 200 years ago, so vineyards, animals, agriculture, um, but uh, around 1900, uh, we specialized uh, in wine. Um, my family always had a big enthusiasm for, for wine. And uh, like Gerd in the beginning, uh, my grand-grandfather, they were um, only uh, wine growers. So we had a couple of vineyards and we gave the grapes to the cooperative here in Bad Dürkheim. So I'm actually based in the same area, Pfalz southwestern part of, uh, of Germany, the second largest wine region in Germany, but the most beautiful. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, it's so we're, we're quite close to, to France, actually, the, Fr the French border is maybe uh, half an hour from us. Uh, it's a very warm and dry region. Um, and it's, it's perfect for, for wine. So uh, yeah, my family always had this enthusiasm for, for wine. So we decided uh, to give up um, the animals and the other agriculture, the vegetables, etc. And uh, we focused on wine. And then my grandfather, uh, he had this idea to set up his own estate. He was always very uh, eager to produce his own wines. Um, so he, uh, yeah, he decided to, uh, um, to establish uh, our own Flüger estate. Unfortunately, then we had the, the two world wars and it, uh, yeah, we had to postpone that, that project. Uh, but uh, right after the second world war, um, he, uh, he started uh, our estate. So we produced our, own, we produced our own wines since then. First vintage, uh, I think it was uh, in the early 50s, uh, 51, 52, and we produced around, I think, five or 6,000 bottles. Uh, I always say this is the amount we're, we're drinking on for ourselves at the moment. <laughs> um, so it was quite a small start, but uh, we were always focusing on, on quality. Uh, we always cultivated uh, traditional grape varietals, so we had we never had something to do with uh, new grape varietals like uh, I don't know Kerner, Müller Thurgau, Huxelrebe, Morio Muscat. Uh, they were quite famous and popular in the 70s, 80s uh, here in Germany. Uh, but we always focused on traditional grape varietals like Riesling, um, like Pinot Blanc, or Weißburgunder, and Spätburgunder. Uh, Gewürztraminer, of, of course, um, yeah, and uh, again, quality uh, first. So that that was our um, our idea. Um, my father joined the company in the in the eighties, and uh, he uh, introduced uh, organic farming on on our estate. So he he was basically one of the pioneers for organic farming uh, in in Germany. Uh, in 85, uh, nobody thought of a vineyard being a, a living place. Nobody thought about cover crops, about cultivating the soil, establishing biodiversity in the vineyard uh, to create uh, a stable and resilient uh, system in the vineyards with uh, yeah, uh, different cover crops, insects um, and, uh, and the living soil. So that, that was uh, very new. Um, for the area, for us, of course, there was uh, no uh, knowledge and we had to, uh, to try and error in the beginning. And it was very important to have a, a network a connection with other colleagues, wineries uh, here in Germany, but also in Elsass, uh, where we could uh, yeah, share our experiences. And step by step, we, uh, yeah, we, we became better and uh, we felt that we we're on the right way. Um, uh, we, uh, we could taste it uh, from our wines. We saw it in the vineyards. Uh, we really enjoyed the biodiversity. 
And uh, yeah, we felt that this is the right step. This is the right uh, method to produce uh, sustainable and authentic quality. Um, so I, I basically grew up uh, in that uh, atmosphere. Uh, I, uh, I decided to, to follow my father in, in 2003. So I went to, to Geisenheim to the university and I did a few uh, internships uh, in South Africa and France, uh, Burgundy, Elsass and in uh, Languedoc. Uh, so I, I never became a flying winemaker. Um, it was my plan in the beginning. I think it's, it's cool to, to travel uh, wine areas and to collect ideas and philosophies and wine, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, I wanted to come back. I wanted to be home and produce my wines here on our family estate. Uh, so for that reason, we're, we're, not lo we're no longer traveling a lot, but we're drinking a lot of wine. So you can't see it here, but I'm surrounded with a lot of beautiful bottles. Uh, we're still tasting a lot of wine uh, from, all, from all over. Uh, basically, uh, Italy, it's, it's Spain, it's France, it's Germany. So we're very interested in, in taste and in quality. And I think uh, that's something you will taste also um, in our wines. Um, in 2008, uh, my father and me, we decided also to do the next step and uh, we became certified by Dynamic. Um, it is uh, something that uh, is uh, for us uh, the, the final or, or the, the, next, the next level. Um, our idea was to produce the most authentic wines uh, that are possible and the biodynamic farming for us brings even more uh, the connection between the soil, the plant, the atmosphere and us. So it's, it's something very authentic once again um, and we feel very happy and feel, it feels very right uh, to, to work that, that way. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to be back here with, uh, with Opimian um, and you choose uh, a nice selection. I have a few wines ready here uh, that I will taste with you. Uh, like yet, we have uh, a mixed case of, uh, of Rieslings and it's funny because there's also a Fuchs mantle in it. Um, we also have a Michelsberg and we have Spielberg. So all the three wines are classified as Krüß. Um, that's also important to know for you. Uh, in Germany you have, sometimes it's a bit difficult to understand the quality system uh, in Germany. So we decided to keep it simple. The wine is complex, but not the system in our, on our estate. So that means uh, we have, uh, let's say, um, a quality pyramid of, uh, of origin. And uh, the crews, so the single vineyards, this is our top quality level. Um, and then we have uh, our estate wines, and they represent um, us, our idea of winemaking. They are very fruit driven, easy drinking. Um, super uh, fresh wines, uh, but uh, let's say the, the core wines, the identity wines of our estate um, definitely are the Cruz. So yeah, let's start with Fuchsmantel. I have it here. It's from vintage uh, 2019. Um, 2019, beautiful vintage. Uh, everything was in the right place. Uh, this year we're really fighting, uh, Gap mentioned it. Uh, the weather this year is uh, a bit crazy. We had a quite cold uh, spring and the last five, six days uh, it really rained like hell. Um, so, um, and then between that we have some really warm and hot and sunny days. So yeah, it's challenging this year. Um, but, uh, but we'll make it. I think it will be a beautiful vintage again, 21. Uh, and with our team, with, uh, with all the people helping us here, uh, yeah, we try to, to make the best out of it. So Alex, what does the like torrential rain, what does it do? Sometimes damages the, the actual vine, right? But does it also, do it, do the soil drinks it up and then do the grapes get too large or what happens there? I mean, that's, I mean, the soil and the, the soil structure is very important. And I must say, uh, I'm, I'm super glad and happy that the last 30, 35 years, we really cultivated our soil. Uh, so our, in the beginning, uh, the water 
um, yeah, as you said, was drunk enough by the by the soil. Uh, there was no erosion uh, in our vineyards. But uh, three uh, yeah three days ago, we had uh, around 90 liters per square meter uh, within uh, five hours. So that's that's a lot of rain in a very short time. Uh, and of course, then uh, you you have some problems, and there were some uh, yeah there was there was a lot of water in the streets. Uh, I have friends. Uh, the cellar was full with water. Uh, um, so here on our estate, everything was fine, but uh, it was uh, a heavy, heavy, heavy rainstorm. Um, wow. I think we also had a little bit of hail in some of the vineyards, um, but uh, I will I will have a look tomorrow. Um, it doesn't look that there's a lot of damage, but uh, once again, it's it's challenging this year. Yes. Yeah, it just it's one thing you don't need, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. but uh, but that's nature, you know, and uh, I think that's uh, that's part of our personality as well. Uh, sometimes you can't change it; you have to accept it and don't stick with the problem. You know, try to find a solution, try to work your way through that problem, um, and um, and make the best out of it. Uh, so we have to be positive, optimistic. Um, and uh, that's that's actually something uh, that in, in the rest in the rest part of Germany a lot of people say that about the Pfalz area. Uh, we are very optimistic. We are very positive about things, and we try to find the best way out of the problem. So you, you uh, sound like a winemaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, in that area we have we have good wine. We have good food. Uh, at some point, I mean, whenever you come, you have to travel and see that that area, the southwest of Germany. Uh, it's it's a very very nice area. It's amazing. You have the the forest. You have mountains. You have the Rhine River. Uh, again, you have super nice restaurants. It's very local, authentic. People are friendly. Um, we say the Pfalz area is not a region. It's a feeling, and and that's oh. about it. <laughs> very cool. Okay, so I yeah. interrupted your tasting. You were you're tasting the uh, the Fuchs mantle, yeah? Fuchs mantle, right? Yeah, and I have the Mikkelsberg here. Yeah, we'll come to that one uh, next. Mm. Uh, Fuchs mantle, I mean, get explained it already. It's uh, it's the coldest or the coolest terroir uh, in our area. It's it's quite high up, surrounded by the forest, hundred uh, percent yellow sandstone, uh, very fresh, straightforward, good fruit, good acidity. Um, quite juicy, um, yeah, a wine that is uh, super nice to drink and, and quite refreshing. Very nice. I can say to both you and Gerd that uh, a lot of people will have heard this before, but Riesling is, is the sommelier's um, grape, and it, there's a good reason for that. There's so much going on there, isn't there? I mean, it's just the, the depth of flavor is terrific. Yeah, I mean, I think Riesling is definitely one of the noble grapes in the world. Um, and you can do so many things with Riesling. I mean, you can do a sweet wine, you can do sparkling, you can, uh, you can produce an easy drinking summer wine from it, but also a, a very um, distinctive and characterful, authentic uh, dry Riesling from a, from a crew. So um, Riesling is like a, a bit like a chameleon, you know, uh, but uh, um, it's super interesting. Uh, it ages well. Um, so for, for us, Riesling is, is a super interesting and, and really noble grape. Agreed. Let's come to Michelsberg. Michelsberg is a quite small vineyard. It's uh, facing south. Um, in Balz, as we are um, um, between the Rhine and the Palatine Forest, most of the vineyards are facing uh, west or east, and there's only a few facing south. And you can imagine a vineyard facing south uh, gets uh, the, the most uh, sun, so the grapes are always very, very ripe. Um, the special thing here with Michelsberg, it's also quite close to the forest, so there's always a wind. Um, and uh, the result is uh, that you have very warm temperatures during the day and during the night the temperatures uh, are dropping a bit uh, and the result is uh, a lot of fruit, a lot of concentration, um, very ripe, um, good food, uh, fruit uh, expression, um, but it never 
gets these high alcohol levels uh, because the, during the night the temperatures drop. You always keep the acidity. Um, we're, I'm a big fan of wines uh, that you can really drink, you know, and I don't mean uh, only a glass. I mean the whole bottle. That's that's what we like. Um, and uh, Michelsberg is for us it's one of the best examples uh, that uh, you can have a wine concentrated, ripe, rich, but easy drinking. And I think that's a perfect example for the cool climate that we that we have here uh, in our area. Great. Berg, by the way, one of the oldest crews uh, in the area. Uh, it was mentioned uh, for the first time in the 1600th century. Um, and uh, we have a big wine festival here, the, the largest wine festival in the world. It's called the Durkheimer Wurstmarkt, the sausage market. Don't ask me why, uh, but it's a big wine festival. And, you know, my, my village, uh, we have maybe... 20,000, 24,000 uh, people living here. But in September, during two weekends, we have 700,000 guests. So it's a bit like an Oktoberfest, but with wine, mm -hmm. only wine. There's, there's a one place where you can buy beer, but nobody goes there. <laughs> and did, did that get canceled last year? But it'll probably go this year, yes? Um, yeah, it got canceled last year. Yeah. I'm not sure if, uh, if it's going to happen this year. Yeah, but it'll be back no matter what. Like that's, uh, I know I'm planning to come to Provine. It wouldn't be as fun as the one you just described, but uh, no. <laughs> yeah, but that, the wine festival will be back. Uh, it has yeah. such a good tradition, 600 years, um, so it will be back. Marvelous. Okay, and the last wine in that uh, um, crew case, it's uh, Spielberg. Uh, again, 2019. Um, Spielberg is basically the backside of uh, Michelsberg. And it's super interesting because you have limestone uh, in the underground and there's a layer of, uh, of Buntsandstein, which is colored sandstone, red and yellow sandstones. Um, and it's facing west. So we're looking to the, to the forest. Um, so again, it's a quite cool microclimate. Um, and from the soil, you get a mixture of this really nice saltiness, minerality, um, in combination with uh, lemon fruit, uh, passion fruit. So it's quite exotic as a Riesling, um, but it stays serious. And I, I really like the persistence, the aftertaste. So it's a super good um, food pairing wine. And uh, Spielberg, you know, the name stands for uh, great films, cinema and wine. Yes, right, exactly. Quite so. Well, I'll ask you one of the questions that was uh, asked by Lan in, in advance and uh, on and uh, the Pinot you're getting to, but if you could only choose one case between the Chardonnay Quartzits or your biodynamic Riesling Gewürz, uh, which one would you recommend? And I, I said, Alain, I said this to uh, Alex earlier, it's like asking him what his favorite child is. So it's a dangerous question. Yeah, I hate that question. It's unfair. Yeah. Uh, That's right. <laughs> um, so, so I think we can just easily say buy both, right, Alex? Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's right. buy both, uh, enjoy both. Uh, I think it's not a mistake. Um, I mean, Chardonnay definitely. It's in, I mean, Chardonnay is all over the world. You find it uh, in South Africa. You have it in in France, of course. Uh, you have it in California, in Europe, um, Germany. Uh, had to find its style when it comes to, to Chardonnay. And um, once again, we try to produce wines that you can really drink and enjoy. Uh, so for me, Chardonnay, um, I decided to produce a Chardonnay without any oak influence and no malolactic fermentation. So we wanted to show the fresh and fruity side um, of Chardonnay. Um, I spent a while in the Maconnet area in France and I was super uh, impressed by, um, let's say, the basic wines that they produced because they were exactly like this. They were fresh, they were super fruit-driven, acidity, and, and so animating. Uh, and I decided that uh, when, uh, when I'm able to produce Chardonnay here, so when I take over the responsibility here in the winery, um, I will actually go for a Chardonnay style in, in, in that way. So it shows the light and fresh and easy drinking side of, of Chardonnay. And I think, I think that's something uh, we also 
um, need. And uh, again, here in that cool climate, uh, Chardonnay without oak influence is, is super interesting. Um, so not, not buttery and oaky, but more, but also not hard edged like a Chablis either, right? It's, it's got a round edge up from what you've described. Right. I yes, mean, we, okay. we leave the wine on the on the lease for quite a long time, so it has this roundness and balance and the hint of creaminess. Uh, but there's no oak influence. There's no right. uh, buttery uh, aromas. Okay. Um, but I can also, of course, recommend the the buy dynamite. I have it here. Uh, so buy dynamite. You see, it's uh, it's a slightly different label. Um, and um, I mean, I'm a winemaker, but uh, I think winemakers also have a uh, or should have a, a bit of a, a, an art, an art uh, thing, um, and we sh we should be creative. Uh, I think that's it's a beautiful uh, job we're doing, uh, working with nature, but and and. I think we have to be creative uh, in, in what we do. And biodynamite is actually something where we can be very creative. It's a blend, it's a cuvee. Um, and I wanted to, uh, to do this under a different label. And as we're biodynamic since 2008, um, I decided to create this label where we can be a bit more playful, uh, a bit more creative um, and just express ourselves. Uh, and uh, this wine basically stands for our biodynamic farming for the idea uh, yeah, to be uh, not only a winemaker, but also an artist. Um, the combination of Riesling and Gewürztraminer that you have here in that wine, uh, that's basically something super traditional. Uh, we always had Gewürztraminer, we always had Riesling in that area. And I still remember my grandfather, he, uh, this year he, he turned 91, still alive, um, still tasting wines with me. Um, and uh, he actually planted these vineyards and they, they are planted together. So Riesling and Gewürztraminer coming from one vineyard uh, and we pick them together, handpicked. Uh, it's a, it's a fermentation together, so co-fermentation. Um, and, and then you get this super uh, connection between Riesling and Gewürztraminer. Riesling brings the acidity, Gewürztraminer brings uh, a lot of flavor and, and aroma. Uh, it, it kind of, because the acidity in Gewürztraminer is a bit lower, so it, it creates this balance, uh, it's super mouth-watering. And this, this, is a, this is a wine I would pair with sushi and fish and some Asian food, a bit more spicy. Um, I remember my, my wife, she worked as a chef in a restaurant and sometimes she, uh, she goes a bit crazy and she cooks very spicy. And I remember a, a bottle of biodynamite once saved my life because she had added too much uh, spice, spice in, in the mm. food. Uh, and I think uh, you should always have uh, a chilled bottle of biodynamite in your refrigerator. Uh, that, that can really be helpful. Great. And I've been waiting for you to go to the Pinot Noir because there's a Pinot Noir question for you as well. Yeah, exactly. But, um, but are you going to the Rouge first though on the bio, biodynamite? Um, I'm going to the Pinot Noir now. Okay. Or is, there, is there another question uh, to the... No, the... I, I think that that's it. So. Okay, cool. So we go to Pinot Noir. Uh, and I must say, I mean, we, in the beginning, we talked a lot about Riesling and of course, Riesling is like, it's our DNA, you know, we are so connected to Riesling. It's, it's always been around us. Um, but, uh, for me, my, my really, uh, passion that I have, uh, is next to Riesling and next to my family, it's, it's Pinot Noir. Uh, and I always say Pinot Noir can, can be, uh, the new Riesling in, in our area. Um, if you look to the climate that Burgundy had uh, 25, 30 years ago, we have it now. We have it here in our area. Uh, we have the soils uh, for, for, to produce great Pinot Noirs. And I think we have the knowledge now. Um, when, I, when I see my father, he never had the chance to travel. He was never so interested in, in Pinot Noir. Well, he produced Pinot Noir or Spätburgunder. Um, but he never tasted a great Pinot Noir and he never saw the vineyards uh, in Burgundy and he never talked to a winemaker there. Um, and for me, uh, I think Pinot Noir is, is something, it has a lot to do with passion. You have to understand that grape varietal 
uh, there's it's not nothing about technic things uh, it's it's something emotional with that with that grape um, so what we do now is we, we planned a lot of Pinot Noir the last five ten years um, we select only uh, clones from France uh, we work a lot with Selection Massal um, and uh, our our aim is to produce uh, a Pinot Noir from Fals, uh but with a with a French feeling you know so we don't want to copy burgundy in a way i mean we're influenced by it uh, but i think in that climate here cool climate once again we can produce super elegant uh, super delicate uh, pinot noirs and there's there's a there's a lot to come in the future uh, not only from our estate uh, here in that area there's a lot of other winemakers like Gerd, but also others um, and we, we're really passionate uh, about, about Pinot Noir. So there's a lot to come, I can promise. Let's have a taste. Yes, and, and while you're about to taste that, um, there was the question about the 2019 uh, Bundesstandstein, Pfalz und, und die, uh, oh, see now I'm flipping into German, uh, 2017 <laughs> Pinot Noir uh, Dockheimer. Yeah. Yeah, so the difference, I mean, uh, the vintages, um, both good vintages, um, 19, um, maybe a bit riper, uh, but I think we developed a bit uh, in, in terms of our style. Um, I think in 17, we were still playing a little bit uh, between the, the German style and, and the French style, so we had to find our way. Um, and uh, 19 is already really on track. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's exactly what I, what I expect from, uh, from a Pinot Noir, from a cool climate. Uh, it's coming from sandstone soils. Uh, so it has this freshness, it has this acidity. Um, there's a good fruit. Um, we, uh, we age the wine in, uh, in big oak barrels. So we very, very, um, um, uh what's what's the word so we, we try not to over oak the wine uh there's only a hint of oak just to underline the the character of it and i think in 17 we used a bit more oak uh yeah we wanted to show a bit uh what we're able to do uh and and now we're we're really coming back it's it's i think 19 is it's much more pure uh and and honest uh, than than 17 and I think it's really a step uh, to, to a next uh, level, the 19. Great. Yeah. Uh, maybe some, just, just for you, some technical facts. Um, it's uh, it's hand-picked. Uh, we do two days of co-maceration. It's a spontaneous fermentation for about eight days in stainless steel. Um, and then we take the young wine um, out. Uh, it goes directly in uh, in oak barrels, 2,400 liter. It's uh, oak from the Palatine Forest, so it's super local and regional uh, product, uh, and it stays there for another 12 to 15 months. Um, there's one filtration, but uh, but that's it. I mean, the the wine making is super. Uh, um, yeah, defense. Uh, we we don't really make the wine. I always say we go along with the wine. Uh, what we do is we taste a lot. Um, we decide if everything's okay. Uh, sometimes we need to uh, to take the wine from the lees a bit earlier. Um, but um, our aim is, or I, I really like to have the wine on the lees uh, as long as we can. We do a bit of batonnage in the beginning. Um, yeah, and, uh, and and that's it. So uh, it's it's there's no it's it's nothing magical that happens in the cellar. Oh, um, it is so. I think the magic <laughs> happens. In the that, that's 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 uh, important for me to uh, yeah to, to, uh, to tell you that that's the that's the most important uh, information. Right. If you have a living soil, a living vineyard, if you take care of biodiversity, you try to pick the grapes at the right moment. Um, uh, I think then you uh, you have the, the best potential to produce uh, great wines. And then I would say that even if you're low intervention winemaker, that there, it's still a magical thing that wine comes out at the other end and that's so so wonderful to, to taste. So Absolutely. That, that's great. Uh, Mandy is asking about the 2015 uh, Bundestein um, 
if I'm not saying that right, but Riesling, and uh, wondering if it's coming back. And I usually say to this, Alex, that there's so many um, possibilities when it comes to this, the reasons why it will or won't come back that we can't say for sure, correct? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we still have that wine. Uh, the Riesling yeah. Buntsandstein is, uh, let's say, the partner wine to that Pinot Buntsandstein. Buntsandstein is colored sandstones, red and yellow sandstone. That's a typical soil type in our area. Um, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, maybe we'll be back in the future. Uh, we have that wine here. Uh, it's an important wine for us, like the Pinot is. Um, yeah, we will see. Yeah, good. All right. Well, if I think, can, can I, Alex, can I open it up to questions for both of you, for both you and Gerd? Yes, please. And uh, I know that Kim Chen has one, so why don't you go ahead? Kim Chen <laughs> has a very inquiring mind. Okay, uh, I'll go with Gerd. Gerd, you know, I love your wine because last year I went crazy. Um, as you saw, I love the Gerber Seminar. I love... Uh, the, the Malbec, the Pinot Noir, but this year, if I only have one wine to put okay. to pick, which one should it be? Which one? Oh my God! No, don't. We, we told you that was an unfair question, Kim Jen. <laughs> yeah, but uh, super difficult. Super difficult. It's that I don't know. I mean, really, I don't know. I probably would take a. a yeah, probably the, the Pinot Noir or a Riesling, but um, I, I wish I would, I, I never come in this situation where I have to do this decision. I mean, look, I'm surrounded by it. <laughs> I, I don't have to, this is not something that occurs normally to me, this sort of thought process. And it's like Michael said before, you know, it's like choosing your children, you know, which is your favorite or, or whatever. That's, but, and, um, and, though, and you can always say that in private, who your favorite child is, but you never do it. Well, that wouldn't even <laughs> <laughs> um, No, I hope, yes, take, take all of them. <laughs> yes, there you are. Take all of them. Different, differently, different times, different occasions, but uh, they'll do a great job. Mm. And, and I think I'm going to help, help answer that question for Kim Chen, and that is that the mixed cases are always such a great idea mm. because you do get the, the different senses of it and so and, and I do that all the time and I'm thinking if you were to get the 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 step mixed case and the Fleur, uh, a mixed case you'd have five Rieslings to do an incredible tasting with your friends to to actually see the differences in those crew and in the in the different winemaking styles but How's not that? only that, you also have five of the most amazing vineyards around here I mean uh, which gives you a, a kind of a view of, of what this area is about in, in, a, in kind of a snapshot and on top of that you could you know as I said these wines have an age rating potential of five ten years and plus so the, these are also cool really good wines to put down to maybe to take a few bottles away for later on to uh, to enjoy when they mature a little bit because that's one of the great uh, qualities of Riesling is how they taste after five, ten years, which is even, you know, it's, it's a fantastic experience to, to taste some older Rieslings um, of these sort of, uh, sort of quality levels. Uh, and if you get both Alex and my box uh, together, two cases, it's not that many, it's 10, 12 bottles and you get like an, an amazing amount of uh, quality and uh, the differentiation in, in, and longevity. So you, you, know, you don't have to drink all at one go or something or one bottle. You know. these, are, these are wines to, to, to store as well. I, yeah. I have the, two, the Pinot Noir 2017, 2018. Oh, well. <laughs> so I have to complete my collection to yeah, with the yeah, 2019, yeah. which especially it's a Jane's Good Carol. So which means it has uh, scored really well in the tasting. So my next question is for Alex. Same question. Yeah. Among all the kids, which one would you recommend me to pick? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Once again, I think that's an unfair question, <laughs> um, but I make it. I make it simple. Um, go for the Pinot Noir. Go for the Pinot Noir because this is uh, this is the future of, of Germany. 
Uh, there's a lot of passion in, in these wines and, and uh, I think you, you will be excited about that. Nicely done, Alex. I'm very impressed. <laughs> That's great. Well, and we are coming to the top of the hour and, and I did want to wrap it up, but to also talk about the fact that uh, the founder's choice is with Alex Pfluger this time around. And we're not going to tell you what it is because it is a secret. Uh, we have over 1,100 members in the Founders Choice program now, and if you're not in there, uh, you get six bottles uh, of the same wine, and it's one that Jane chooses that isn't offered in the the catalog. So you are the only person in Canada that of 1,100, but that's still small, that that actually has access to that wine. And um, and what what we find is that that. What I find, I'm, I've been a member of the program for some time and I always drink one when it arrives and then I sell them and some of them I keep till they get uh, very old because I really enjoy older wines. But And those of you who are on the call uh, and are regularly, I apologize if I repeat myself, but uh, I, that, that's what I do. And I, I did also um, just wanted to, to talk about uh, the the full range of, of Rieslings here again that, that are just absolutely phenomenal and uh and we had some writing done by another canadian master of wine her name's barbara phillip it's on page 48 of the catalog and um she is a specialist in rieslings and so we deliberately sought her out she's been to germany and spent a lot of time there and so it's really i think it's well worth reading that article about riesling that's in the catalog as well so and any uh, parting uh the thoughts, uh, Alex and Gerd? I know Kim Chen has one, but we'll wait. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, gentlemen, you've been uh, very, very thorough, and we really Thank appreciate you. your going through the numbers of wines that you did. And uh, and I'm going to enjoy the rest of this bottle, as you said, uh, gentlemen, well, the rest of both of these bottles. <laughs> I better go and see my wife now so she can help. And I have to say, my wife's favorite grape is Riesling as well. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. And and thank you once again, and we will see all of you again. Thank you, Opinion members, for joining us today. And hopefully the thunderstorms behind me didn't cause too much trouble. At least I didn't lose power. So we will see you again on the next one. Thank you all. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank, thanks, Kim Chen. Bye.